on the other foot now. We've all had Brian introducing us and um, describing us and what we're talking about, but now we're looking at him and his life. And I just want to sort of start by saying, as you already know, that he was a very successful dealer when in 1982 he launched the International Ceramic Seminar and Fair, and today we're celebrating the 40 years of his achievements. And what he's done is he's transformed the world of the ceramics dealer, collector, curator, and scholar by bringing together in one place each June a new radical and magical combination of some of the best dealers in the world, strict vetting procedures, academic lectures given by an international range of experts, and above all, a sense of glamour, fun, and camaraderie. And this conversation will explore how Brian developed such a special vision, how he and his wife, Anna, delivered it year after year for all of us, and what impact it has had on the detective arts in recent generations, and the fine arts too, of course. But before we begin, I just wanted to thank Brian himself and Mary Jones for all the hard work they've done in putting the slides together for me, well, Brian and me, today. I hope you enjoy them. I think they're fun. And that's the point of this. Brian's terrified, I'm terrified, but actually, this is just for us two people who know and love each other to have fun talking about Brian. And we're going to start with your childhood in Dub um, Dublin. How did it all begin? Did I move to Devon? No, <laughs> no, Dublin. There's me tripping already. Yeah. Uh, how did it all begin? I was very lucky that, in fact, I grew up with quite amazing parents. And to a large extent, I probably was allowed to do most things that I wanted to do. I always wanted to be in the arts world and particularly to be an actor. And even as a child of five and six, I this to me is what it was all about. So as the years went by, I was going to theatres in my early teens. I was going to hear symphony concerts in the Royal Dublin Society. I was going to the theatre. And for example, you know, you see on the screen there, I remember hearing Gina Bacur and Rosalind Turek, who were probably the two of the greatest Bach players ever at the time. And to see that as a, literally as a child just thrilled me. And then I was able to see Don Giovanni with Dame uh, Suther Joan Sutherland and Geraint Evans. So this inspired me all the time. And it was making me want to go further into the theatre. And I started then, at that time, also training at night time in um, theatre school in Dublin. Unfortunately, I suppose it was my parents wanted me to sort of follow through what my father did. And uh, he was the general manager of a large insurance company and with branches all over Ireland. So he thought, I suppose at that stage, um, Brian would be very good if you went into that and I got a job in a, an insurance company. The only very good thing about that was I met my darling Anna then and we knew each other then from that very, very early time. Um, but I was wanting to do further. Do you want me to ask a question there or...? I, well, I just want to say that on the screen you can see um, two plays that Brian went to, but the third one, he's the star, and you see his name as third down on the left-hand side, and the insurance company had its own group well, of actors. Well, well yes. Um, I obviously was not paying much attention to my job, and uh, <laughs> I thought, of I'm so bored, I can't bear it, and uh, I joined the Insurance Institute of D Drama, and next minute I'm playing sort of a lead part in As Long As They're Happy. And the following year I did Witness for the Prosecution. And actually I, I feel unbelievably nervous when I tell you I actually played the Charles Lawton part that he did in, in the movie. Can't you imagine that now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Terrifying. Uh, you can. <laughs> and actually you were only 17 when you met Anna, weren't you? Yes. A long, long time ago. Yeah. Yes. They'll be married 60 years next year, which is wonderful. You're right. But what happened next? Because you, you trained as an actor, you did brilliantly well, and 
There you are. It's the new pin-up in touring companies. Well, no, you came to London to wear the diamond. Well, actually, what it was, uh, that, that actually is a picture of me when I first went into rap. I, before that, I was very lucky. I auditioned for Weber Douglas School of Dramatic Art and RADA, and I was very lucky. I was offered a job, not a job, a, a place straight away in Weber Douglas, which I took, and uh, spent three amazing years there learning so much about drama and particularly about oneself. And, uh, as an actor, when you're learning, you have to find out about who you are and what everything is beside you. Because I know, Roz, you asked me to, when we were talking about this, I think it's important to mention one tiny thing. I remember in the very first term, um, the teachers were very strong and were brilliant. And they said, now, all of you, there's 12 of you in this class, I want you to lie down on the, on the ground. And I thought, what's all this about? What are my parents <laughs> paying all this money? We'd lie down on the ground. And after five, ten minutes, the teacher said, right, every one of you get up. I want you to tell me, what did you hear? And I swear to you, every single one of us got up and said, nothing, nothing at all. Right, he says, I want you to start all over again. And I want you to learn everything that you hear and remember and what you feel. And that changed my life. I got to know who I was inside and always be aware what the sounds are around you, what everything is. And of course, this takes you in the theater, but this changed my life, certainly going further into the art world by running the fairs and doing things, to be aware and knowing. And you also do the Japanese theatre techniques. Indeed. I'd, yes, I've forgotten that. Um, I joined a, an amazing company called the Hannah No Theatre, and we played in Dublin and in Paris, and uh, it was all about the Japanese theatre, but it was using masks. And again, quite frightening to explore who you were. You picked up a mask and you put it on and the other actor actually was doing the same sort of thing, or with 10 of us or something. But you had to relate to these other people. And it's extraordinary what you find out about yourself because you could suddenly be a very different character and you had to relate to what other, maybe that other character could be terrible to you or what. It sounds probably very silly to you now, but believe you me, quite an expansion in, in the way you thought. And what were your early parts? Oh. Well, before that, when you saw the photograph of me as the young actor, I was very lucky. I got a job straight away from drama school in a rep. And believe it or not, I did 26 plays in 26 weeks. So what you would do, you'd rehearse all that week, and then you'd open on the Thursday night. Friday morning, you start again doing the next one. 26 weeks later, you were, your mind had gone. But actually, it's amazing what you were able to do. What you have here is, these were tours that I was doing. And why it's, I'm explaining why the difference of a rep and tours are. The tours actually, you first of all rehearsed in London. And after you'd done it, you, then you could put, maybe appear in Edinburgh, Southampton, Plymouth, Bristol, you name it, everywhere. So what you had then was a time during the weeks when in fact you weren't rehearsing. And this started my love of being wanting to be then into the art world as a dealer. Because in those days you could go every little town there was and you could buy things. First of all, I started buying some bits of jewelry. 
I didn't really like jewelry, but anyway, they did sell because dealer friends of I took them on. But anyway, eventually I started looking at ceramics. And this is how the ceramic well started. We started, I started buying it. Anne and I had got married when I was still in drama school. And um, we then started I was sending it back to London. And Anna, as the wonderful person she is and was, um, by that stage, actually, she was working in London, and she was the first lady ever to be working uh, at Lloyd's. And um, but she was still able to do this, and we took a stand in the Red Lion in Portobello Road. And that's how we started that business. Wonderful. But the one you see there, it was a, an amazing tour of Pride and Prejudice. We went everywhere, and I played Collins. Can you imagine, Brian, as <laughs> Vicar Collins? <laughs> and you, you played it up. You've got lots of accolades for how, how funny you were. Well, I, yes, I did, mm. uh, yes. And yes. then in Turkey, look at you there. Well, again, that was another tour, and you can see there's the Daily Mail one, and uh, <laughs> it was the... Yes, and I say the Daily Mail today. <laughs> uh, it was the reluctant debutante, and no, I played no. the officer Bullock there. And uh, <laughs> again, we played for, I don't know, months and months a year, all the way around the country. Uh, terribly exciting. And uh, again, wonderful actors to work with. Wonderful. And just imagine Anna going down at weekends and seeing you wherever he was in the country and taking back loads of stuff you bought at all the antique shops and things. And then you went into, I don't know if any of you saw Brian or see him, he's still on television in The Saint and Zed Cars and all those English television programs right. that we grew Dick, Dick Barton, special agent. Oh, Dick Barton yeah. too, you can think of the music. Unfortunately, it didn't last after six weeks, they didn't renew it. <laughs> And then you auditioned for A Bridge Too Far, which must have been amazing. It was only on the television last week. I watched it again in your honour. Well, this is actually quite a story because um, Anne and I had been married that while and uh, Giles was already born and Emma Jane was due and, and Giles was about three years of age. And, I said to Anna, look, I've been offered this part in Bridge Too Far. Do you, what do you think? Do you mind if we go? And uh, she said, if you want to go, go. So anyway, I signed and I did it. And I was there in Daventer making that movie for over six months. Well, it was probably one of the most exciting times in my life because you name it every major star in the world was in it, and they were all the most extraordinary people, wonderful. And Dickie Attenborough, the d director, he was, he was just amazing. And seeing actually that picture of me with Tony Hopkins there, Anthony Hopkins, reminded me actually, we were shooting this one day, and we were up on this house on the bridge, which it was in Daventer, but it was meant to be Arnhem Bridge. The German tanks were coming across and shooting and banging, and, and we were supposed to be holding the fort there. And he was playing, Hopkins was playing Frost. Actually, Frost himself was there helping, mm -hmm. and he was there. But you know, I remember thinking this very day, we were standing there, we were supposed to be shooting back on these huge, tanks were coming. And I thought, afterwards we shot it, we said, I was frightened. And I thought, my God, we've only just been making a movie. What this was like in real life. Wow. Terrifying. Wow. Terrifying. But it was an amazing movie. It was originally four hours long. <laughs> I think they show about two hours of it now, so you can never find me. Oh, well, I did. I did. Anyway, so there we are. We've, we've, you've the theatrical career, you've, you're married to Anna, and you've got Portobello Road. But then what happens? You move into your own shop in Knightsbridge. Well, what happened then was um, 
we needed to find somewhere. And uh, we moved into the Knightsbridge Pavilion, which was just directly opposite Harrods. And we were there for um, a few years. Again, wonderful. And I had the first shop in on the right as you went in the door. We met a lot of clients and amazing people there. Unfortunately, the building burned down. So we lost everything, had to restart again. And what you see up on the screen there, and I was very interested, was the start of what we were then trying to do at that time. You could see Somerset House Art Treasures, and again, when I think of it, I really was quite ridiculous that I offered to loan pieces to that exhibition, and they accepted and did it. It was wonderful. It was opened by Prince Philip. And on the bottom one there on the left, it was the Burlington House Fair. And uh, again, that was what really changed my life as well. We did that fair. And Mrs. Thatcher at that stage opened it. And why I have that photograph there at the moment is because, again, about 30 years later, I met her at Giles as my son's parents-in-law's house, Lord and Lady Flight. And I had a long, long chat with her, and all I could hear her say, wonderful, she said, we're talking about the American fairs that we've been doing, flying the British flag. <laughs> Excellent. And you opened in Burlington Gardens. We then, yes, we moved to a lovely gallery in Burlington Gardens, just opposite the Museum of Mankind. And... Uh, we were there for many years, and uh, everything started really in a big way from there. So that the fairs began in 82, and then you moved out of Burlington Gardens in 2007, by which time you were one of the greatest ceramics dealers of your generation. So it's a wonderful whiz through, as we now approach looking at how you started all the fairs. And the first one, as many of us will remember, well, perhaps no, you're all too young, some of us remember, was at the Dorchester, and it began in 1982. Tell us about how you came to set it up. Well, what I'll tell you exactly. It? Sorry. No, no, I just want you to. Tell you exactly how, because Anne and I were going to New York to one of the auction houses at the time, and it was winter time, and uh, the airport, as usual at that stage, was filled with smog and everything. So our flight was left behind and uh, still there sitting. And suddenly, across the concourse, along, called, along came a man called Constantine. Now, Constantine was a Netsky guy who was working in the Knightsbridge Pavilion where we had our, our place. And I said to him, what are you doing? Where are you going? He says, I'm off to Hawaii. Now, this is January, freezing cold. I thought, wow, this is <laughs> holiday time, Hawaii. Oh, no, 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 he says. I'm going to uh, the Netsky Convention. I said, I could hardly spell Netsky. <laughs> and I said, well, what's a Netsky Convention? He said, well, I'll tell you what it is. Every year we go to a different place. And this year it's in Hawaii. And dealers, collectors, curators all meet together and the dealers bring their items and uh, they sell and they talk and they have academic things and uh, off he went. Anne and I looked at each other and said, mm. Mm. we need to start something here in London because there was nothing. Grosvenor House had collapsed. There'd been a strike because of the house maids or something and they, nobody was allowed to go in and out. So we then suddenly thought, let's have a ceramics fair and seminar, but not just have a fair. It had to be tied up with all the academic side. So I went to people like you. First time I met you. I went to Margaret Medley and very much well, if you'll all remember, Margaret Medley was very much a lady who saluted you. And she questioned me, and then she said, yes, I will. 
Years later at a dinner, she said, uh, Brian came and uh, he was so enthusiastic about what he, he was going to do. I said yes. <laughs> and otherwise, I probably could have been in big trouble because I'm mixing the museums and the commercial world together. People like that, and Charleston came in, major people. So we started the Dorchester, 1982. And what many of you won't probably know is that in those days, there wasn't a lot of admiration between the curators and the dealers and the auction houses, if any. I can remember some strange encounters, even when I was at the v &A. And um, what you achieved was this amazing sense of we were all at it together and we all loved it together, which I don't think anyone else could have brought it together in the way that you did. And here we are 40 years later. And look at us. I mean, you know, we can't live without all being together talking about all those things that once never happened. And Brian, I know, designed the original booths. He wanted to have the intimacy of the muslin with the little canopy. Well, I, I just didn't want to have a boring old fair with sort of stands. So as you'll see, the one on the left there, um, I said, we've got to have wonderful ceilings to it. And we, and drapes all the way around. This 1982 was miles ahead of anybody thinking of anything like that. But we used to laugh in any call it the knickers hanging all the way around. <laughs> and uh, looking back now, they were a little bit like knickers, but they worked. But they worked. And tell us about the queues. What sort of people did you get in those queues? You name it. The biggest names ever, you know. Hmm. You'll know the names that came here. Anybody, anybody who was anybody was coming. Yes, but Mrs. Wrightsman and Lord Rothschild, you know. Yes. Standing outside. Absolutely. Lineups. It was riveting. Yeah. It was Such extraordinary. Fun. And as you'll see, the queue was all the way around the block, and uh, they went on like this for years and years. And it was so exciting. And it wasn't just all the fun of fabulous dealers providing sensational pieces, it was all the other side of things that Brian mentioned earlier, the academic side, and all those lectures going on simultaneously, four at a time, four well, five days, yeah. four days. I remember we, there were four days, as you can see, it was June 12, 13, 14, and 15, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and we had 36 lectures. <laughs> I remember Tish Roberts, after the second, yeah, she said, Brian, I want to go to all of them, and they can't do it. You've got three on at one time. <laughs> so there were three on, three on, three on. There were nine on of the day. So there were 36. And as you can see the names, they were quite extraordinary. I mean, Oliver Impey, John Mallet, who is here, you. Uh, you can read them all there. I mean, they were, ex they were extraordinary. And um, the names of the dealers who were involved, you can probably see them better up here than I can see them down there, like big names like Bluet and Spink and Sparks, and all big names. It was, it was truly exciting, and it was lovely to be a lecturer because usually in those days if you did a lecture, you, you know, wheeled in and wheeled out again, lucky if you got a glass of water, let alone anything else. And what Brian, in those earliest years at the Dorchester, did, he took a suite upstairs for the lecturers with a full bar lined out, and you had to put her there to look after us, to mop our brows, and we could go and lie down if we felt a bit, bit nervous, and it was just extraordinary. It was the luxury and the, you know, being spoiled that made it such a joy to be included in it, and that comes on to the, the fights to be at the dinner. You founded a very grand dinner committee. Tell us about them. Well, we always want to make sure that everybody worked together, that the dealers, the collectors, the academics all knew each other. So we started what we call the collector's dinner, and that took place every year. And as soon as it came out, you know, the, the Flugers and Lady Duchess of Bedford and Utah and Victoria Leatham all wanted to be involved, and they put the name on the top, you know. And I think of it, within literally some months, these people said they wanted to do that. And uh, there's a lovely picture there of Vicky Leeds and with Anne and me. And 
Jutta Putta there, who used to be always at for the lectures, seeing everybody coming in and helping, and the Flugers. And the Flugers then even took it further, and they used to always hold an extraordinary dinner at the Ritz. The Flugers were amazing people, and they collected all kinds of things. But they didn't collect French porcelain, and I always remember Roz saying, you know, everybody is invited apart from the people on the French porcelain. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. But, but he did have the fantastic figure of Chen Lun. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't Absolutely. know how he deigned to go for a bit of French porcelain, but at least he did for that. Yes, well... But I, didn't you say that they all started the refusing? The refusing yes, dinner? that's we had a separate dinner because we weren't <laughs> included. You're absolutely right. And actually, some of you will remember that, that young American curators, you know, couldn't, couldn't queue up fast enough to get onto these, hoping that Fluger's collection might be persuaded to come their way if they danced the right tune. It was all very dodgy stuff in those days. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was all part of the fun of it, I thought. It was wonderful. And then by 1984, of course, you got known for specific special events in this Well, world. if you remember at that time, just before that, the Hachokago, which was the um, wonderful porcelain that was pulled out of the sea, and uh, it sold, and I think if, if I remember correct, at Christie's, and there were about three or four big dealers, Axel, Axel Wilfert, and um, Erlim and Howard, and a couple in America. And of course, in June that year, Axel, who was doing our fair, put out the most amazing stand with all this hatch or cargo, and he built it. It was stunning. Built up, I mean, there were, there were other pictures of it. And Hatcher himself came, and that's a picture of him there, talking about it, how he brought it out of the sea. And then it was all the exhibitions. That is a list of the exhibitions you did at the Ceramics Fair alone from 1983 to 2010. And they were inspirational. Aileen, you did two. Debo Gage did one from Furl. And just on and on they went, these wonderful collections that were brought to London or shown differently in London than they would normally have been just for the delectation of everyone at the fair. It's a most staggering And they, they were amazing. They, they were amazing. But also, I must say that, because Aileen is here, Aileen wrote those two amazing catalogues, and there are still catalogues of those. Um, you did an extraordinary work on those, the one on the continental, the documentary pieces, and the ones on the English pieces. And amazing. And as you said, Debo did two. Two, sorry, one at Furl and one on the um, British American Tobacco Collection. Oh, yeah, of course yes. you did, yes. yes. Well, they were wonderful, but the Dorchester came to an end and you moved to Park Lane. Oh, gosh, look again, more cues. <laughs> Tell us about the move to Park Lane Fair. Well, the Hotel. Dorchester was being renovated or something like that, and uh, we had to find somewhere we luckily found just down the road at the Park Lane. And there we go again. I mean, the queues were, again, amazing. And it went on for years at the Park Lane. Mm, it was wonderful at the Park Lane. And then, not content with ceramics, you were persuaded to move into silver and jewellery because... Well, how that came about was um, the dealers in silver and jewellery said the fair that you're doing for ceramics is amazing, academic, everybody's coming, would you consider, both of you, Anna and I, to do one for silver and jewellery? And uh, we did. And as you can see, again, there were amazing exhibitions and wonderful lectures. And why I put the one up there on the right, it was a day of the crown jewel jewels, and it was being talked all day long by the top people like Shirley Berry. It was mind-blowing, and uh, we learned so much about the crown jewels. <laughs> well, it was absolutely brilliant, but you didn't stop there, because then you moved again to the Commonwealth Institute, or its That's right. new That's right. appearance, and that was in 2003-4? I think it was something like that. To, yeah. And it was there for a few years, and 
we put together the Asian and the English, the, the, the English and continental ceramics. So there again, we had amazing lectures given by unbelievable people. It was just thrilling, and so many of them. And the very moment that you moved into the Park Lane Hotel in 1989 was when you went international, and you started in New York. And I love the story about how you'd been asked to do New York sooner. Well, going back to the, the early time at the Ceramics Fair, I'm going back to about to 1982, and the first year it was very exciting, and people like Claire Le Corbier from the Met, and the Flugers were there, and Kai Flugers said, Brian, this is just amazing. Uh, we will take it to New York. And of course, I, at the time, I was rather flat. I think, yeah, a London fair would be great taking it to uh, New York. And a few hours later, Claire Le Corbier came along, probably one of, to me, one of the most important curators in the world at, the ta at that time at the Met. And she said, Brian, I beg you, don't dilute what you have. You have something here is, that is extraordinary. If you dilute this, it'll be lost. So I listened to what she said. And we never, ever took the ceramics fair to London. That's why, to yeah. America. And that's why it lasted for so long. She was so right. So you opened in 1989 with a different Yeah, but I always title. wanted to take on New York. Yes. And uh, Anne and I decided, you know, right. They had a fair in New York always. It was called the Winter Show. It was an Americana fair. And I wanted to do a large international show, again with, some, with lectures. So we went backwards and forwards and got to know the unions and got to know Memorial Sloan Kettering, the council hospital, because you have to, in New York, you have to have an opening night with some big charity. And um, we, went, we brought Cat, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering on board, and we opened there up the International Antique Dealers Show. Just wonderful, and the same, same cues as you'd had before. And I've got a list of here of some of the, the famous visitors, but you've probably learned them off by heart. No, I haven't, because I keep forgetting. Would it help you if I read this yes, list? Yes, please do. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. You had Harrison Ford and Michael Bloomberg and Barbara Streisand, Madonna, Imelda Marcos, Jesse Norman, Whoopi Goldberg, Michael Jackson, Oprah Winfrey, Robin Williams, and Rudolf Lurev, just to mention a few. Yeah. So that was pretty exciting. Every day there were major people coming in, whether they were just from society or they were from the movies or what, they were there. And there was always a buzz. Madonna, well, Madonna, and place like that. You know. Yeah. Well, the press called it the second coming of the Mayflower, which I think is very good indeed. But all was not peace and kindness and love, was it? Well, it's very interesting that Mario Buwata, you will see sitting on the right there, he ran the winter show, and when he heard that the Hortons were coming to America to put on a show, he shouted and screamed, we don't need a, a fair coming over here. We have a fair. We don't want a fair with vetting. Our dealers don't need to be vetted. We don't need anything. We have a good show. Anna and I never said a word. And the more he said things, the more coverage we got in the New York Times. <laughs> and you'll see later on the, the different things they said. But on the two photographs that are there, a couple of weeks before it opened, Anne and I were asked to go and have an interview with Manhattan Inc., which we did. And they didn't tell us that they had a camera also on the floor and coming up. Now, see the little cannon on the left there? That was a little tiny thing on the desk. <laughs> Doesn't look tiny. <laughs> so what they did then is they put this out and Mario Boata with his gun because we are coming to New York and they call it the Dueling Antiques Shows. I love it. 
<laughs> but the press gave you great coverage, as you can see, from all the comments there about the British are coming and so on. But I love that fabulous male torso in the, in the um, colonnade. And tell us what happened to that. Well, that was actually a couple of years later. And again, it was a wonderful early, early piece, which was, we gave it the fact to be in the center. And it was unbelievable. Nureyev came in one day, and he came in every day for two or three days, and literally he moved around as only Nureyev could do. If anybody ever seen Nureyev on stage, you know, he was like a, a snorting stallion. He was just amazing. And he'd walk around this, and uh, he bought it. <laughs> And when he died, it was the front piece on, I think it was the Christie's catalog. Amazing. Beautiful. And of course, you had all the academic activities there as well. And what made it new and special? Well, we brought in a very important collection of Chinese snuff boxes, bottles, which came from Burley House which Victoria Leatham and Robert Kleiner put together and curated. And, uh, I mean, that caused tremendous buzz in America. Imagine coming from Burley House mm. and there in America. And then we brought over five or six of the most important speakers. And, as you were saying about Sloane Kettering, I mean, that was absolutely vital. And I know that you and Anna are enormously proud of all the charitable... Um, events you've held both in this country and in America, raising over 40 million over the years, but Sloan Kettering was the first. Sloan Kettering community. was the first, and uh, at that stage they had a charity. It was, I think, Frank Sinatra singing, but Frank Sinatra was getting rather old and it wasn't selling out. So somebody introduced us to Memorial. And, of course, you could never turn down Memorial uh, Cancer Hospital. And they were the most amazing people who were involved there. And we said, of course we would do it. And uh, I remember, I think, the very first year, the first year, I think something like immediately 800,000 was made that just first wow. year. Wow. Over the year, I think something like... 29 million was made for cancer. It was always wonderful. You get back on an aeroplane, and particularly when the dealers had a, had a good fare, mm. and you suddenly mm. thought, we are, and the dealers and everybody has put something in to charity on particularly cancer. Wonderful, wonderful. And then you opened a new fair in New York in 1994. That's right, the Fine Art Fair, and uh, again, that was extraordinary, and the Frick were the benefits of that. And that actually was amazing that, in fact, we, one of the opening nights, I remember, the whole of the fair was opened up to the dealers with dinner tables all the way down the aisles. Mm -hmm. And they brought in designers who would design those tables on one of the paintings they had on their stand. Wow. So dinner was held, and um, a lot of them sold their paintings just because of that. But the buzz of that was amazing. Well, I love the thought that um, silver and jewellery couldn't bear ceramics to be the only one. And then you get to New York and the antique dealers, the fine art people, can't bear not to be there too, so in they pop. And it didn't stop there because um, then, of course, you founded the International Asian Art Fair in New York in 1996. That actually was extraordinary because it actually created Asia Week in, in New York and everything happened. It probably was, I think, the most beautiful fair we've ever done because the tranquility of the Asian art and the fact is we had orchids everywhere and you walked around, you saw this. A friend of ours also sent us over, believe it or not, crickets from China. <laughs> not live ones, oh. little, little ones, <laughs> that when the light shone on them, they made cricket noises. And that was wonderful, the, noise, the buzz in it. Unfortunately, at night time, the security guys 
hated it because they kept them awake. <laughs> <laughs> they must have felt pretty so, Well, they were. So, yeah. so sometimes they come in the morning time and see half the crickets were silenced. <laughs> And, and it, it, it so pleased the Japanese society that they honoured you, didn't, didn't they? They did. They held uh, a wonderful dinner for us in the Alexandra Munro, the director, and uh, the Shaka Desai of the uh, Asia Society. And we were also honoured by the Rubin Museum there. And, uh, Brilliant. Uh, it was amazing. But then came 9-11. Disaster. Well, we all know what happened in 9-11, and you know how the world stopped. I'll never forget it, actually, because Anne and I were actually on, in, on holiday in Venice, and we were sitting in the airport waiting for our plane, and the screens were on, and we were looking up, and we could see these planes hitting into these buildings, and we thought it was a film. And I remember Anna saying to me, I wish they wouldn't show these sort of movies. It must it aff 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 mm. exactly affect people. Mm. To our amazement, this was not a film, this was reality. And of course, we got back to London, and of course, that caused havoc for us, because we had four fairs on in New York in the armory. So what do we do? Because the army was being used by the army and for, for rescue. Body, body bags. Yes. So we couldn't, couldn't use it. So what would happen? Um, how it happened, I will never, ever know. Um, because suddenly we got a telephone call and saying, the Lincoln Center will open up for you. There's the opera house there to the right and there's the, the, the music place as well. And they gave us the area in the center to build our <coughs> fair, Asia Fair. And it went on about nine, nine ten months later. Extraordinary. 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 But you'd also invented a new fair for New York, a 20th century fair. That was so brave and different. Well, again, People kept on saying, you know, you're doing these fairs. Surely you can make one of these, this modern one, uh, work. And uh, we didn't know much about modern stuff, but uh, angels jump in. Well, <laughs> and uh, we did. And again, it was quite extraordinary. And saw wonderful modern pieces. And that went on for about 10 years, 1999 to 2008 or something. Wonderful. I love to sort of be starting it in the last year of the 20th century. It was hugely topical as well, sort of extraordinary. So just to give you all an idea of how exhausting, uh, just to think of running all these fairs, this is the programme from March to October 2002. That's in one six-month period. There's Brian and Anna and, of course, Giles and Emma Jane helping too. Um, they were known as Horton, Horton, Horton and Horton. And um, yet, just to manage that was amazing. Tell us about your energy. We all need some. When, you, when something needs to be done, you just do it. I mean, <laughs> you know, if you have all these fairs going on and you have a gallery going, you, you have to do it. And, uh... Wow, you do. But it's just amazing. And of course, that wasn't the last because then you opened in Dubai in well, this, 2009. This was my daughter's fault. Um, Emma Jane had friends in Dubai and she was out there and she said, it's just an amazing place. And uh, before we knew where we were, we were talking to the royal family there and uh, they acted as patrons, not financially, but patrons. And the next minute we had this unbelievable fair in Dubai and it was one of the, the most exciting. And, it opened later on in the, the day and went on late at night time. And after that, you know, you were able to walk around the lakes there and have late dinner and fantastic. And, and you told me the reason you could do it when you did do it was a change in the rules of importing objects. Well, they were amazing because, in fact, 
they had to, they did have to change the rules because the dealers would normally have had to pay taxes going in there, but they changed the rule just for that. Oh, I see. They oh, did I, it for you. I don't think it was ever done again after that. Right. So the dealers, I mean, how could a dealer come in and pay a huge amount of money on all that stock no. and wouldn't get it back for it? No. But they did. And uh, really exciting. It was, it was amazing. But then things changed in London, and you had to move home again, and then you had this ingenious idea of the pavilion in the park. Art Antiques London, mm. you're right. And, uh, well, the ceramic world, like everything else, was getting smaller. And um, a lot of, the, if you look back on the very early f fairs we had, there were 65 top international dealers. You know, by this time, we were down to about 30. And now, probably there's 10. Yeah. So something had to be done by opening it up, and we changed it into a general fair, but bringing in the ceramics and the silver and all that sort of thing. Hence, Art Antiques London. And I think it was a very beautiful fair. It was. Look at the inside for the dinner one night. And being able to look out there and see Prince Albert with the, the sun shining on him, it was always magnificent. And there again, you could see the collector's dinner. Yes. You know, the same thing going on and on every year. And look how Brian looks exactly the same as he did at the first fair, you know. <laughs> Didn't take its toll, I can't think why not. But it got to 2018 and you had your last fairs and... Um, Anna Summers Cox wrote a wonderful article in the art newspaper which must have touched you hugely. Well, coming from somebody like Anna, it means a lot. Yeah. And uh, the headline of what it is, is it's extraordinary. Yes, so, so she you know, gave this wonderful sort of um, farewell to Brian and Anna's affairs. And you also, um, from 1984, I've got here that you were acclaimed for combining academia and commerce, which I think which is a rather lovely thing. And um, Anna said you were the dealers who put intellect into arts fairs, which I think is equally, equally wonderful. And then Polly Heitner from Chicago described you and Anna as joining hands across the world. So what had been achieved in those years was absolutely amazing. But when the fairs finished, um, you, want, you introduced these wonderful two-day seminars. And um, actually, it's someone here who gave you the idea, isn't it? Absolutely. Go Julia on. Weber. Yeah, yeah. And we were in London, and the phone went, and Julia phones and says, I'm coming over to London. Can I come to lunch? And to have lunch with Julia, of course, is always wonderful. <laughs> Halfway through lunch, she said, you know, what are we all going to do? We're, we're going to miss all these academic things. Um, where were all these curators going to meet? And she said, will you carry something on like this? And that was the start of these. So here we are. So it's Julia. You can blame her. No, it was wonderful. But, but the point of all of this is we've reached this point because of your absolute passion for ceramics. And now we've got a group of objects that Brian has sold over the years um, to tell us why he's chosen these as the ones he most loves. And, and one of the things that will come out of it is your passion for white figures, um, early French, and new dimensions. So we're going to whiz through these with you telling us about the ones that fascinated I mean, the great you. difficulty was to choose. I mean, there were so many pieces that have been I was beastly to him. We kicked it's, out it's loads. It's very, it's difficult. Mm. But to me, particularly that, that group, I mean, you can tell me more about the Shepherd's Eyes than I will ever know. Um, but to me, this is one of the most amazing, tactile, mm. beautiful pieces of porcelain that you ever find. And uh, it's huge. The yes, the, the tranquility of it is just amazing. And the one at the top right, that I bought privately from part of the family of the Earl of Powers, Powers or Powers, what is it? <laughs> and uh, again, I thought it's just amazing. Sold that to an American collector, and he then left it to Chicago, and it's in Chicago. The bottom one, again, to me, is a piece of Vincennes of the shape that 
every time I look at it, it's so, so exciting. Mm. You know, it's a buzz. Mm. And that's in a private collection in this country. I mean, it's Oops, amazing. Sorry. Yeah, then. This amazing clock uh, was, I mean, it's got the Chinese, Chinese porcelain at the top. The, the barrel is Chinese the barrel, porcelain of the of clock. Course. And the Van Sen flowers and the Meissen figure. And it's just amazingly done. I mean, the naughtiness of that little monkey looking <laughs> down there. And she's holding a mask. That I sold to the Ariana Museum, and it's there now. I mean, it's... I gather you said it's, it's even wish. more exciting. Well, I wished it was Madame de Pompadour's, because what's so annoying about it is she does have a clock that's with mice and figures and Van Sen flowers. Um, but it was by Pierre Loire in 1755, and this is Julien Loire. And she did buy a clock by Julien Loire in 1755, but it didn't mention the mice and figure. And so it goes on, you know, the documents are so maddening, because you think you've struck gold, and then it's whipped away from you but by something else. that's why we else. learn. Well, I know, it's exactly why we, we learn, but I was so pleased you chose that one to go in I for today. I think unbelievable. Mm, and then these ones, oh. Well, the Shanti Chinaman, the perfume burner on the top there, I think it's complete, I think it's an unrecorded piece. I mean, it's just amazing. And the blue and white Song Clue teapot there. I mean, there's the handle and the spout. I mean, it's, it Glorious. just says everything. Tell us how the perfume burner works. Well, you have to turn it over like that, and yes, and make sure, that, oh, how do you mean how it works? Well, it, you see it with the little holes in it, and you want Oh, to yes, you put it in, and you, 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 write the, you light the incense. So it's it, like a joystick almost. Yes, you right. Spat, you poke yes, it. And you get a lovely palm. Lovely palm. They needed lovely palms. And this I know you love. Well, that I think was one of the most exciting pieces I bought. It belonged to the Dukes of Westminster. And as you can see, it's got the royal arms of you know, Augustus. And uh, I think, can you imagine being given your porridge in bed in that at the morning time? <laughs> Quite a lot of porridge, I expect. <laughs> expect you'd be out of bed in no time. Um, and then, then the other continental pieces are these. They, I think, are two of the most beautiful Fürstenberg um, vases I've ever seen. You know, you have Hercules and the other figures around there. But it's the wonderful mock work on the porcelain there that is, is, is just unbelievable. Um, they are in a, a royal collection. Mm -hmm. Now some English pieces. Well, those. I'm always terribly excited about any of these early English pieces, and I think these bow pieces, I mean, the colour on these bottom pieces, the quinces, the quince box, I'm not sure I could be wrong, but I don't know of other pairs of quince boxes like these. The apples, are, yes, there are some. And, of course, the wonderful... Um, white pieces at the top, the sweetmeat shells. I mean, they're unbelievable. Do you just want to hold yes, them? Yes, yes. And this, oh, Brian, this photo's got your name on it. Well, when I got those, my theatre thing came out. You have Garrick in the centre, and you have Henry Woodward and Kitty Clive, all actors, great actors for the 18th century. So to me, to have this with the bow pieces of the, can the candlesticks there with the, the putty, and have it photographed in a theatrical way, to me, it was very important. And I think it's still an amazing photograph. I think it's a marvellous photograph. It doesn't matter the difference in scale or anything. It's just commanding. And then you love your birds and ducks. <laughs> well, of course, Chelsea, I mean, they did some of the most amazing piece, the Turines. On the top left there, you have this amazing duck. There is another little duck, and I think it's the Ashmolean, or am I got it wrong, it's Fitzwilliam, I think it's Ashmolean. And the duck has turned the other way. But I don't, again, know of another one. I mean, the little, the look in his eye, I mean, it's, he knows everything. <laughs> and the billing 
doves on the bottom right. I mean, extraordinary. Wonderful. And then two more. Chelsea. The artichoke with the little bird on the top. Again, I had two of those. The one there on the left is in a very important collection in London. And the, of course, the one on the right, the Chelsea hen and chicks. And I think it says something like, big as life. And it's, it's, it's that size. Huge. And it was in the 1755 Chelsea sale. That's right. Sale. Yes, That's so right. that went, it's thrilling. I can see where you do all that. And then these Chelsea pieces too. Well, again, they have wonderful Chelsea and those uh, finger bowls. I mean, the, the painting on those, look, look at the, the butterflies, the leaves. How, how they painted that, when they fired it, how it didn't change and burn. And the crayfish, the movement of this. And the Chelsea apple at the top. And I, I love it, the way that you've actually put the bow one underneath the so I wanted see. to compare them, yes. And it's wonderful just to compare the two different factories there, the, both apples. Again, yes. rare. And then your favorite things of all. Well, Chelsea Hand Sloan's are, to me, some of the most amazing pieces. And uh, you'll see I've supplied a lot to the Metropolitan Museum. I private collections. So you go to the Met and you see some of the most amazing Hans Sloan, some of them are here, and some of these are private collection. But look at the quality of the painting. It's, it just buzzes, doesn't it? It sure does. And, and for the audience, remember the top left-hand plate. You're going to see it again um, at the end. And then now we're going to look at nine teapots. And I love this range of teapots that have been whittled down. So take us through them. These are Chelsea, but only four known of each. Three of them are in museums, and these are in a private collection. Um, I think, to me, they're the most exciting pieces of early Chelsea that I will have ever handled, will ever handle again. I mean, Look at the look at the parrot being held back. Look Spout. at the, 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 I know it, it is. They're extraordinary. They're wonderful. Well, these teapots we're looking at range between 1725 and 1870 in date. So they're going to be quite transforming as we run through them. Those three Meissen ones. Yeah, well, these are great Meissen ones. Again, um, I just love the painting of, of these, and you know the sunflower the one on the right and the one at the bottom, to the extent they would do a handle like that with the figure on the top of it. Mm. And it's still in existence. It still hasn't broken off. And the top one in 1735 with that wonderful butterfly. These, to me, are, again, some of the most exciting Meissen pieces that they made. Thinking of that sword this morning and how hard it would have been to hold because of the detailing on the handle. Yeah. That'd be pretty difficult to pull from, wouldn't it? It's extraordinary. And then there are two more Meissen pots. Absolutely. I mean, that wonderful Meissen Kedugan teapot or wine pot. And as I know you're probably going to ask me, how do you put the wine or the tea in there? You turn it over and there's a hole, and then you turn it back fast so that it fills that, and then you pour it out. Well, then you pray, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that it doesn't come out. <laughs> but it, again, there are very, very few of those, and uh, that's in a private collection in America, and again, extraordinary. And then, and, the, sorry, Brian, sorry. Because and the one on the left, again, is equally important and, again, just amazing. Amazing. And then this is the new look, Brian. Humour. These are hysterical, I think, and absolutely thrilling. And you've got them at the moment in the gallery, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, they're really you know, exciting. You, one has to keep up with the times and have a, a bit <laughs> of slightly more modern, even though, you know, they're talking about 1870, that sort of thing. But I think, again, they're amazingly wonderful done. If you look at the one on the left, I 
just love the way they've put the mushroom on the top. And actually, if you, you, the finger just fits in onto that, so you pick it up quite easily. And the one on the right with the, the coconut and the, the China man climbing over it. And on the back, he has a cue, you know, a pigtail. And again, it's beautiful. It's thrilling. Mm. And you see, you're not just innovative in that way. You're innovative, innovative in the livery of your shop. You know, when you opened it there in 2007 and you said you were going to do it in red and white, I'm sure all the old dealers in um, Duke Street were terrified that this would look frightfully... Well, it was very interesting. When we moved in there, uh, we were incredibly lucky having moved then from Bell Eaton Gardens uh, to have found this place. And... Uh, it was filthy, filthy dirty, so we redid it, and uh, we did it in a very modern way so that you could show classic antique stuff that would work with it. And one day, an old guy walks in the door and he says, I just want to tell you, I love the gallery. You've sexed up Duke Street. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> and also, you've extended to some, some contemporary pieces. Tell, tell us about that and, and, and how she came to <coughs> Well, the, you. the pieces on the right, she does porcelain and pottery. She's from Sweden, and her name is Gunilla, Gunilla Maria Akerson. And I think she does some of the finest, most beautiful, thin porcelain. And you can see the light shining through it. I represent her in London and in America. And our pieces, I think they're just stunning. And uh, yes, I have some pieces in the gallery. Wonderful. We've seen all the successful mixing of antique and modern. Brand's legacy includes that. It also includes imitation by others who've now followed with the vetting and the lectures at, at other fairs that one knows about, the new camaraderie between us all, which is very special. You're the result of the French Porcelain Society, which of course goes from strength to strength. None of this would have happened without all of your fairs. And I just wonder how you sum up the 40 years. What do you feel most proud of? I, I find that quite difficult, actually, but I, I think proud that, in fact, we've been able to do something to put the, our art world together so that, in fact, you know, academic side, the, the dealer side, that we all have worked together and we still work together and that it's there for posterity. The and, website. And that, to me, is important because youngsters have got to know mm. and that's why I love the fact that these are recorded the, all the lectures the articles are there and somebody starting tomorrow can check 350 of them and, uh, it, it, It's an, an amazing legacy I well, mean it's absolutely it's, thrilling legacy and it's not over yet, believe you me there's more to come but I thought I'd, I'd just move on and talk a moment about the family because you may all think that Brian's completely absorbed in ceramics but don't be fooled um, Giles always says um, the days that Brian goes to the opera is an O day because he's in a good mood because the opera means so very much to him and gives him more pleasure he doesn't miss anything at the Opera House or at Glyndebourne or whatever. That's, that's part of the magic of his life. But above all, it's the family. It's the children. It's the grandchildren. It's everything that they mean to you and how proud you are of them. Very. Yeah. Incredibly proud of Giles and Emma Jane. And without them, Anna and I could not have done what we did, without any doubt. And the grandchildren there on the the left, the five little monsters. But, uh. <laughs> well, I was talking to Giles and Emma Jane about Brian and <coughs> ceramics at home. Or, um, but one of the stories I heard was that um, when objects came, um, Brian brought them home, he'd put them in the kitchen and everyone would gather around like show and tell and then Brian would start washing them, get out the toothbrush or whatever it was. And they all sort of caught the bug in a way, didn't they? And I just hope that they'll instill that in, in your grandchildren as well. So we'll have not just Horton, Horton, Horton and Horton, but a few more added on to the Hortons as well and the Hayes as well. So, so it's, just, it's just a wonderful family story, which brings me on to birds. I, I mentioned them briefly over the um, 
<laughs> over the terrines. But you may not know that Brian, as a child and a young man, bred budgerigars of amazing varieties. He had 80 different birds, and they meant everything to him. And as a birdie person myself, I find that really, really thrilling. And um, parrots, well, there you see a fabulous parrot. And um, I gather you don't just admire parrots, but he had a pair of parrots that he was this is your story, um, that he was um, selling in the shop and a particularly important and wonderful collector came in and suddenly, as he was trying to explain to her the benefit of parrots, he started popping up and down like a parrot on a perch and imitating the bird, which I, you, you tell me that's true, Paul. Brian denies it, but anyway, that's one story. And Anna has this lovely quote, which actually came out in one of the press cuttings in a former slide about retirement, and she said, oh, no, Brian's like a parrot. He, he'll never retire. He'll wait till he falls off his perch. And aren't we the lucky, luckier for that? We don't want him to retire early either. We want him to wait till he falls off his perch. So, Brian, for 40 years, you've taken the works of art of the past and given them and their enthusiasts a sen sensational present, which should work well for the future. But you are today's hero of ceramics, and we are incalculably grateful to you and Anna too, and last night Anna presented to Brian this wonderful book to mark the 40 years, which she has had published. Many of you know about this because it has 40 essays in it by 40 people who lectured over those 40 years. And it's got reminiscences from many of you in it and pictures of Brian and Anna and the family as well. And this, of course, is the Chelsea plate that we saw earlier. Um, it hasn't hit the shops yet, but no doubt it will. Um, I'm not quite sure how, but if anyone wanted to have a glimpse at it, um, it's very new and very fresh, and it's here. And I think it's a wonderful, triumphant thing for you. And you see Anna here, having done so much with this. Um, she's in her livery um, uh, the, the livery clothes of the Art Scholars Company, Brian's uh, liveryman as well. And those are just little accolades that build up these amazing people who, as far as I'm concerned, can't have enough accolades because I think they I all wish I just want to well. say, I knew nothing about this no. until last night. And I was told this was happening. And this and must have been two years' work on this. It's extraordinary. Yes, it was two years' work. And I didn't tell you, it's called A Man with the Butterfly, The Man with the Butterfly Tie because Brian uses it as his signature tie at the opening of all the fairs. He wears a butterfly tie, and when he had one that was getting a bit tired, Leslie Green Bowman gave him another one, and he's been kept up in butterfly ties ever since. So that's why it's called that, um, but it's really an honor of you, and our admiration for you is extreme. But I, I must say, though, believe you me, I, I'm flattered you say it's an honor of me, but I promise you, I could never have done any of this without my darling Anna. No, and Anna, Ever. we've got to Ever. thank you for Anna.